I'm Ashton Addison from Event Chain for Investment Pitch Media and the Crypto Coin Show. And today on Blockchain Interviews, we have Garrick Heilman, the head of research for Blockchain.com and a visiting fellow of the London School of Economics. Garrick, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here, and I'm really excited for this discussion today. Thanks for having me, Ashton. You're very welcome. Let's dive right into it. If you could just start with a little bit of your background in the space, your recent focuses, and your lead up to heading the research team for Blockchain.com, then we can dive in deep. Great. So I first got interested in cryptocurrency during my PhD at the London School of Economics. I was studying, studying under uh, professors Albert Richel and Neil Ferguson, and uh, I was looking at uh, alternative currency markets and alternative currencies. And this thing called Bitcoin came across my screen and uh, it led me to kind of moonlight. Uh, during my PhD at Coindesk, I joined Coindesk in 2013 to, to build up the research uh, program there. Uh, after the PhD at the LSC, I went to Cambridge, uh, University of Cambridge, and, and started the blockchain and cryptocurrency research program at the Judge Business School. And uh, in May, it will be three years at blockchain.com as the head of research. So I've been following this space as a researcher for a number of years now, uh, teaching, lecturing on it, and working with regulators to try to help uh, you know, all of us come to grips with this new uh, transformative technology. Definitely, Garrick. And since 2013, the Bitcoin and the whole blockchain space has expanded exponentially. And I'm sure it's been an exciting ride for you. And, and for me, it has. Um, and, and even with blockchain.com, you know, they've been one of those companies that's been around since around that time and even before then as well. They've expanded so much as well. And it used to be, you know, blockchain.info and it just had these basic services, but now they seem to have expanded out. So if you could touch on for the viewers, you know, what is the a quick overview of blockchain.com and what they're primarily focused on right now. Great. Yeah, so uh, people who have been in the space for a while uh, know us for our Block Explorer, the .info days, uh, also our non-custodial wallet. Those were our two flagship products for, for a long time and also a great uh, data hub of charts and data that can be downloaded by researchers like myself. So uh, that's probably how we're best known to the, to the OGs or people who have been in the space for quite a while. Uh, recently, we've really expanded uh, our, our product offering. We've uh, created an exchange. Uh, this is a custodial product. We recognize that not all newcomers, especially to crypto, want to take full responsibility uh, of their private keys. There's some extra challenges and, and responsibility involved there. Uh, we're offering interest rate products. Uh, we can pay 12% on, on US dollar stablecoin deposits, which is, I think, one of the best rates for a custodial platform. Uh, and, um, you know, we're just continuing to expand into new areas as crypto continues to evolve as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done a number of innovative things like airdrops, uh, you know, in the past couple of years since I've joined. Um, and we're just, uh, you know, looking to continue to, to grow with this space as more institutional money comes in. We've seen a lot more institutional business. Our lending desk is one of the biggest uh, lending desks in the, in the whole space. And uh, it's just an exciting time to be being crypto right now. Definitely. It's been an exciting year and I'm not sure who could have predicted what would happen to Bitcoin at the start of 2020. And I know that you, since working in 2013, when you worked at Coindesk and you're working on your PhD, you also were running the State of Bitcoin report, which was an annual report. And I'm sure there'd be a lot of people interested in, in those reports nowadays. Um, so do you think you could give a little synopsis of you know the state of Bitcoin in 2020? Do you think it did better than expected and you know, overall, just a net positive for the whole community? Yes, I think this has been the best year for crypto assets and for Bitcoin since I've been following uh, the space. Now, some wow. people would argue that, you know, getting the first million uh, people to adopt and use cryptocurrency, that's the hardest step to take. And I, I think there's some merit to that without question. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of kind of the acceptance and legitimization and the um, ownership uh, at, at really the highest kind of most powerful levels uh, of Wall Street this year. And, and, and I mean, it's pretty incredible, I think, for those of us who've been in the space to see that. And it's hard not to say, wow, this was just an amazing year, maybe the best year ever, depending upon your perspective. Could that have been predicted at the beginning of the year? I don't think so. I don't think anyone <laughs> in January was, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of expecting the year we've had. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the validation that, that Bitcoin has received uh, this year. So uh, it's been an amazing year. But as we talked about in our monthly webinar uh, last, uh, at the beginning of this month, 
you know, with all this renewed public attention, you're going to see more policymaker attention. You're going to see mm-hmm. regulators more actively involved than they've been. And we're seeing some signs of that already with uh, the the non-custodial wallet uh, regulations that were announced uh, last week and some other things. So it's going to be another really important year next year. You can't really kick back and rest on your laurels in this space. Totally. And uh, you mentioned also, you know, the institutional adoption there. You also mentioned that blockchain.com is has that, you know, institutional desk and they're starting to get involved in that more through your research and since the beginning of 2020 to now the end of 2020 there's it seems like there's just been a lot more institutional interest at least publicly advertised you know a lot of institutions will go and secretly buy uh, when the price is down but now it seems like we're getting news of all these different institutions that are just jumping on board you know do you see a flip that has been switched or was there a trigger for that and why now this is all coming to light about all the institutional adoption yes so I think there's been some huge changes since 2017, which was a really retail driven, um, you know, uh, kind of adoption cycle. This cycle, uh, what, what's different? Why have we seen the, 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 the herd finally arriving? I mean, for years, people have been talking about Wall Street's coming and it never happened. Mm-hmm. This year, it seems to have finally happened. What, what changed? Well, a lot of infrastructure uh, has been added since 2017. Uh, you've got companies like Fidelity and others that, you know, institutional money managers are very comfortable with, have accounts with already now playing in the space. You've seen regulatory clarity, uh, you know, the futures markets that were launched um, by the Chicago's futures markets in end of 2017, they've been around for a number of years, they haven't been shut down. Um, so those those are those of, um, I, I think that's been really positive. I think just the longevity should not be underestimated. The fact that this has not gone away mm-hmm. and keeps bouncing back. You know, I still hear people saying, oh, this is like tulips, it's a bubble. Mm-hmm. Tulips never bounce back. It went up and it went down and it stayed down. <laughs> yeah. This has bounced back at least a half dozen times. And, and that's not like your typical kind of bubble uh, mm-hmm. or, you know, some terms, I mean, you know, for those of us who know this sector, you know, we would laugh when we hear terms like Ponzi scheme thrown around, mm-hmm. um, you know, but yeah, again, you know, Bernie Madoff, you know, up, down, these things don't come back. You know, mm-hmm. of course, for us, it was clear this wasn't a Ponzi. But for a lot of people who weren't really well versed in crypto assets uh, and, and only just knew a very, very little amount, uh, it was easy to dismiss the space, you know, um, you know, with with those kinds of um, accusations being thrown around. But I think a lot of that that FUD has gone away. And now you're seeing very serious people, the big boys, so to speak, getting in and getting in, in a big, big way. Mm-hmm, definitely. And I've seen a lot of short clips recently of those same notable investors that are now investing, either saying Bitcoin was going to zero or Bitcoin's useless, Bitcoin's dead. And there, there's even sites that have tracked how many times Bitcoin has died. I think it's in the hundreds of times of, of articles that it was declared dead. And you're right, it just keeps popping back up. It's not one of those one-offs where it's like tulips and just crashes and it doesn't come back. And because it is growing so quickly, of course, there's still the the need for retracements and pullbacks uh, in a normal market cycle. You know, something can't go up forever, every day, every minute. Um, so that seems normal. And so I want to like jump ahead a little bit with Bitcoin here and looking at 2021. And as you said, 2020 seems to be the most explosive year so far. And just overall, besides the price, just the adoption uh, for the, from the community and institutions seems really great. Do you think we will continue on the same trend uh, for 2021 uh, or even accelerate even further or maybe even slow down and and maybe go as far as uh, a a potential price prediction of Bitcoin by the end of 2021 next year? Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult to, you know, forecast the near term future. Uh, There's, you know, things that can change the landscape. I mean, the pandemic, you know, what's in store? Is there something like that awaiting around the corner? Mm -hmm. But Certainly with with the momentum uh, of this year uh, in place, I think there's there's certainly a lot of upside in 2021. Personally, Uh, I think the digital gold thesis is is a is the kind of thesis around Bitcoin that's easy for people to understand and really does lend support to the idea that Bitcoin should be a trillion dollar market value asset, Mm -hmm. at least with gold at, say, 10 trillion uh, and all the different interesting ways you can use Bitcoin beyond what you can do with gold. So I, I would, you know, I've, I'm on public record saying I expect possibly as early as next year for Bitcoin to achieve that level. It's not a huge, you know, in terms of how many X 
uh, increase mm-hmm. you need from here to get there, you're looking at a price of just about 50,000, mm-hmm. um, you know, two X roughly, uh, from here, you know, in 2017, we saw Bitcoin do 20 X two X seems like a pretty modest <laughs> uh, move for, for Bitcoin to make. And it wouldn't surprise me, frankly, uh, I, I would, I would not be surprised if Bitcoin hit hundred K next year, just mm-hmm. to put it out there. Um, yeah. that would not be shocking when you've got investors uh, like Guggenheim, and others coming out talking about 400,000, I think 100,000 is a very achievable near term um, price target in, in 2021. But again, what's going to happen with regulation? Mm-hmm. What's going to happen with hacks? You know, what's going to happen um, globally uh, with the economy, with, uh, you know, central banks and whatnot? There's a lot of different things that kind of could play with the timetable. Uh, but it does feel like we're heading towards uh, Bitcoin becoming a trillion dollar market value asset. Mm-hmm, definitely. And I think that your price prediction is conservative right alongside with what I was thinking around 50,000 to 100,000. I recently was watching a, a podcast with Dan Held, you know, Growth at Kraken. And, and he said, potentially, if it was a super cycle, he could see it reaching a million uh, by the end of the year. <laughs> but that seemed a little out of reach. But 100,000 definitely seems a lot more uh, reasonable, even though compared to regular assets, it seems you know, exponentially higher. Um, so Back to blockchain.com for a minute. You know, 2020 was such a great year for Bitcoin and the space overall. Um, do you have um, anything notable that you and your team uh, were working alongside in terms of achievements for 2020? And would you say it was an overall successful year for the research team at blockchain.com? Yeah, for the company and for, for uh, the research team, it's been, a, I think, one of the best years, no question about it. I mean, certainly, you know, rising tide with salt boats, mm-hmm. right? And, and you have these cycles. Since 2017, the company has been super hard at work at trying to build for the next cycle. That's the way crypto seems to kind of grow in these kind of fits and starts and having the infrastructure in place to manage a big cycle like this. So we're really proud uh, of the progress we made on on kind of uptime and and beefing up customer support, um, you know, expanding our products and, and making sure they're they're you know ready for for this kind of wave mm-hmm. we're seeing. We had our best week ever, I think, on the exchange last week, um, you know, and, and so I think the infrastructure is really taking a big step up. We still see problems across the industry, right? We still mm-hmm. hear about outages. You know, we are not immune to that ourselves. So there's still a lot of work um, companies need to do to kind of, you know, continue to handle these massive surges, mm-hmm. uh, you know, but but uh, overall very happy with, with how the company's done. And I think also how the industry has matured. I think there's been a lot of progress across the whole industry since 2017. Definitely. And yeah, it seems, you know, when there is a day when all of a sudden a rush of new entrants into the market are coming in, uh, these exchanges and and service level applications seem to be going down because they can't handle the bandwidth of all the new people, uh, which is a good problem to have, but not a good problem, you know, in the moment. So um, I'm glad that blockchain.com sort of has that covered. Now, Moving forward to 2021 again, uh, I want to talk about, because I know that you're very involved in in economics and following in the political spectrum as well. Um, As you said, it could be a huge year for 2021, for Bitcoin at least. Do you see the current political state of America and and the world economy in determining how quickly or how slowly uh, this blockchain economy is going to progress coming into 2021? Uh. You know, that's a really interesting question. You know, this year, it, and we've seen this before throughout the years, you know, is, you know, crypto correlating with, you know, um, a decline in the value of the Chinese RMB? Sometimes it looks like it is. We saw that spring of last year, 2019. Boy, it was just moving in lockstep as, as the one was heading down in response to trade tensions. You know, we've seen it, you know, really closely correlate with equities and, and gold at parts during parts of this year. Mm-hmm. You know, how tied crypto is to the U.S. and, and the economy overall is still, for me, a big question mark. Mm-hmm. It does sometimes march to its own beat. Sometimes it moves in lockstep with something. Um, but certainly, I think it's reasonable to assume that we're going to continue to see fiscal and monetary stimulus. That's mm-hmm. been made very publicly clear. We just have a new stimulus recently passed. The Fed has been very transparent about what they're looking to do with interest rates, monetary policy. All that's very bullish for, for Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. At the same time, we're continuing to see broad um, technological innovation um, in DeFi and with Ethereum mm-hmm. kind of making progress in ETH 2.0. And so it's all looking really, really positive. The, the thing that I 
probably you know wonder about the most is will regulators continue to strike the right balance mm -hmm. uh, and and also this is getting moved up beyond the regulatory um, technocratic level we're getting politicians now more involved with uh, policy we saw some stablecoin legislation proposed out of Congress um, it sounded like Mnuchin was very much behind uh, a lot of this non-custodial wallet legislation so mm -hmm. it's going beyond kind of the FinCEN um, uh, technocratic level up to the political level and there I get a little more worried because you sometimes see things happen that are for political points you know scoring points reasons and are less grounded in how do we keep the American economy competitive? How do we keep innovation flourishing? How do we strike the right balance between obviously trying to prevent bad guys doing bad things with this technology and also uh, enabling innovation to grow onshore? Definitely, Garrick, that's a great point about the regulation. Make sure that you're not over-regulating and stifling innovation. Um, and and that, that point about the non-custodial wallets and and I, I know uh, a few large CEOs of, of blockchain companies were outspoken about that saying, you know, make sure you don't go too far to stifle innovation. So it'll be interesting to see uh, when the new presidency comes in, how much uh, regulatory uh, bodies will get involved um, and whether they'll be encouraging that or they'll try to put their foot down. Um, now, we're running short on time for the interview, but I want to look forward to 2021 for blockchain.com. Do you have any hints to any of your roadmaps or major releases or what you're looking forward to as the company grows into 2021? Right. Well, I think, you know, we've uh, expanded uh, our product suite significantly in recent years and uh, you know, have the exchange, have a non-custodial wallet, have a block explorer. Uh, have an interest rate product. I mean, it's. I mean, I, I don't know that a lot of crypto companies have as wide a range uh, a product offering as, as what we have. Uh, and so I, I would, with this wave that's coming into the crypto space, you know, my sense is we'll be really focused on making sure those products are you know mm -hmm. leading class and and reliable. And and um, but you know, look, I I'm not the product guy. I'm the research guy. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> I, and I can't obviously reveal anything that hasn't been publicly announced, but but uh, I think you know just making sure that our existing suite of products is really really ready for this cycle is is a huge priority for the company. Um, and um, yeah, hopefully we can just continue to see you know adoption grow at a steady rate. There's a lag, you know. I mean, it's inevitable. Crypto companies can't hire and staff up uh, with massive support teams for a bear market. You know, there's going to be you know, you've got to like, you know, plan if you're going to stick around like blockchain.com has since 2011, you've got to be prepared for the downturns as well as the upswings. And there's always a lag in kind of staffing back up. So uh, please customers be a little patient with us if you're a little frustrated. <laughs> um, you know, we're working as hard and fast as we can to uh, to, to manage the, uh, the intake. Definitely, Garrick. All right. Well, uh, if the viewers are interested in learning more about blockchain.com or for following your work personally as well, what's the best way for them to learn more? Right. So, uh, you know, we have a monthly webinar and pod, you know, we do a regular podcast as well. Now we're really trying to be more kind of visible and accessible. Uh, you can follow uh, myself and the company and our, our leadership team on Twitter. Of course, uh, we're very active on social channels. I do want to mention there are a lot of impersonators out there. Mm -hmm. And so please be really cautious. You know, we send out emails, of course, regularly to our, our, our customers. But you always want to be careful when you get something that looks suspicious or especially online. Just incredible how many um, mm -hmm. fraudulent actors there are out there trying to trick people into revealing things like their private keys, their seed phrase. Never do that, please. We'll never ask you for your seed phrase. Keep your funds safe and contact our support channels through blockchain.com if you ever have any questions about anything that looks suspicious. Definitely. I'll leave those links in the description box below. Thank you so much for your time, Garrick. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. All the best in 2021, and let's follow up in the near future. Sounds great. Thanks, Ashton. Have a great day.